But I'm excited to be here this weekend. Um, my name is Avope. I'm one of the youth pastors here. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this weekend. Um, we're going to be doing some amazing um, things as we talk about peace. But before we get started, I know what you guys are probably thinking. If you were here last weekend, Pastor Norell had a table full of foods, delicious, luscious fruits and foods and all those different things. And here's a youth pastor, and he brings a can of pop, Okay. Let me tell you something, okay? I did not use the budget to buy new shoes, okay? Or a new shirt. The budget, I, didn't, I don't really have a budget. But I'm going to th- keep things a little bit simple this weekend. That's why I have a little can of pump. It's going to be important, but nothing complicated. I'm not throwing my phone like last sermon that I preached. So I just want to let you guys know that I did not use the church's money to buy my shoes. Anyways, as you can see, you know, I just make $3 when I go to the mall. So, you know, I'm rich. But... This weekend, I'm honored to be talking to you about one of the names of God. And it's interesting because I think we've lost the significance of names in this culture. I mean, we live in a world where people would literally name their kids COVID-19 after a pandemic, okay? That's where we're at, we are right now. But in the Hebrew mind, in in the scriptures, we see that names is a significant thing. Because they believed that names reflected the personality, the character, the heart, the future. It was prophetic. It was important. It was connected to God. So when we think about God and we think about that culture, the ancient Near Eastern culture, if we look at all the gods in the neighboring countries in Egypt and Syria and Babylon, they had gods, but those gods were arbitrary. They were random. If you wanted to get their attention, you had to slash yourself and do some some messed up stuff. And even then, you wouldn't even get their attention sometimes. They would just destroy But in that context, here you have the Hebrew God. You have a God who not only knows people, but he wants to be known. He's a God who desires relationship. And he's reflected, and he says this, I am your banner. He has these names that give you a window into who he is. There's another name that used, as Pastor Ronald talked about last weekend, I am your shepherd. He wants to walk with you, wants to guide you. That's the name of the God we serve. This message this weekend is all about peace. And what does a Christian mean when they say that our Lord is peace, that our Lord is the only source of peace in the world? That's a big statement. <laughs> to keep things 100 with you guys, that means to keep it real. Um, I chose this message, but I'm not a, I'm not a peaceful person. Um, <laughs> I'm an Arsenal fan, so <laughs> my life is with a lot of stress. Uh, And you can ask my family, I stress out about things that I can't control. Then I lose track of a lot of things. And and that causes me to feel feel even more, more overwhelmed. And instead of flourishing in all these different areas of my life, I live stressfully sometimes. And I've noticed the stress has a a mental consequence to it. It has emotional consequences to it. It has physiological consequences to it. I mean, prolonged stress, if not handled well, can lead to ineffective relationships. It can have um, impact on your heart, on your respiratory system. It can have really, really physiological consequences. And I'm not actually alone in this issue of stress. Okay, maybe I'm alone in the whole Arsenal thing and I need to stop watching their games because that's just too much. But we all experience stress. We all experience a damaging impact emotionally, physically, relationally, spiritually. We allow anxiousness and fear to creep up in our lives. And some of us, we've already given up on this idea of living a peaceful lifestyle. We've just said, that's, that's, that's my life. It's stress-free. I mean, it's stressful. I can't get peace in this world. I'm just going to wait here until eternity, okay? I'm just living a stressed life. That's my identity. And that's not only a problem in the church. Indeed, in the whole of Canada, in the world, a Statistic Canada just released a, story, a study saying one quarter of Canadians feel stressed or extremely stressed most days. Everyone deals with it. We all deal with it. And it's so fascinating because we are the most resourced. We're the richest groups of people to ever live. And yet, we stress out so much. Canada, Statistics Canada, released another study during COVID saying that 21 young adults 
21% of young adults, or of adults in Canada, not just young adults, 21% of all adults in Canada have tested positive for one of three major mental disorders. You don't have to be a Christian to agree with me that it's so sad to see how much we have, how much we're so blessed with, and how much stress we live in. And what's our culture's solution to the amount of stress that we continue to go through? Three words. Buy more stuff. Buy more stuff. In a culture rampant with consumerism, we have turned peace into a product to be purchased. I can't think of a better example than this um, iced tea branding. It's called Peace Tea. And here's the tag of their advert. It says this, there's peace and happiness in this fresh iced tea flavor and in every can of peace tea. Now, obviously, people don't buy this to get peace, but I think this, this branding plays on this thing that our culture has picked up, that we can convince people that peace is something that they can buy. We can convince people that peace is something that can be consumed. Peace is something that we can sip. Peace is something that we can inhale. Peace is something that we can get from ourselves. Some of our culture also advertises that we can, if we look inward, if we do this drug and, and inward, if we find, we can find peace in ourselves. But we can't find peace in ourselves. We can't find peace in things that other humans create. We can't find peace in those things. Why? Because we did not create ourselves. We don't give ourselves purpose. God does. Whatever ideas we try to find or conjure up to get peace always fail and always fade away because those things end up giving us more stress. Those activities end up making us feel even more guilty. And those activities crush our relationship with God and other people. So when drugs harm our mental health, when pornography renders us unable to show empathy, messes with our brains, when power and politics, the very thing that was supposed to help us feel safe, is a thing that breeds division and hate, where do we go to for peace? Maybe you're a single mom, and with all the responsibilities you have, you can't even think of God or grasp the concept of God as peace. <laughs> Maybe you're a student, and you haven't known peace since AP math or bio. Your studies have been a constant source of stress. Maybe you're sitting here, if you've accepted the lie that my family, they just have a history of mental health disorders, they just have a history of all this stuff, and Stress and anxiety and fear is just our identity as a family. We can't get past this. And you've accepted that as a part of who you are. But God has so much to say to you about peace in his word. And we can discover what he teaches. If you guys want to turn to Judges chapter 6, we're going to pick it up from there. But as you guys find your way in Judges chapter 6, I, I'm going to talk about a few ideas you need to know before we understand this text. If you search up peace on Google, the English definition is this. You're going to get freedom from disturbance, tranquility, maybe a vacation. And earlier I talked about how people nowadays, we've turned peace into a product to be purchased. People don't even associate peace with God anymore. I was, in, I was on vacation a few years ago with my friends, non-Christians and Christians. And I remember on Sunday, I was like, yeah, let, let's go to church. And they're like, oh, wait, why would you want to go to church? You're on vacation. <laughs> well, some of us has turned following Jesus into a stressful work task. And we don't really believe in God as peace. However, in the mind of the ancient Hebrews, the ones who wrote the scriptures, peace was not a product that one purchased. Peace was a presence that one perceived. When the word peace first appears in the Hebrew scripture, it appears as the word shalom. That's a Hebrew word. And, and it often, but not always, meant this idea of wholeness and well-being in all areas, 
individually, socially, spiritually, emotionally. Shalom is a theologically packed word. It's not just a a random word. And what that means is that shalom goes back into the creation story. It starts in the garden. It comes from God. I love how my professor put it. Shalom is how the world was created to be, the way the world should be. That is shalom right there. But shalom also appears in Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, for the first time. And that's after God makes a promise, a covenant with Abraham. What does this tell us? It means that we cannot experience peace out of our own ability. No, no, no. We experience peace when we're in the presence of the one who created us. The one who knows us. The one who created the world and knows how it works. The one who calls us by our name, our God, Yahweh. That's our peace. Peace can exclusively only be experienced in the presence of the one who created us. So Judges chapter 6 starts off by saying this. The Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. The hand of Midian prevailed over Israel. And because of the Midianites, the Israelites provided themselves hiding places in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Utterly embarrassed, the Israelites They were people who were supposed to reflect the glory, the shalom, the wholeness of God. But they sought their peace in other gods, in other things that didn't really give peace. And so they cried out to God, help us, and God heard them. And not only that, God sent a messenger to a man named Gideon. And he tells Gideon, you're going to be the one to liberate Israel. And the story gets interesting. Because the writers of this historical account, they don't even call Gideon a warrior. The angel finds him farming. (laughs) And in order for you to understand how much of an underdog, and some people say how useless Gideon was, they don't spare any details in letting you know this. Gideon was part of the weakest tribe in Israel, and he was the weakest in that tribe. What does that tell us? Gideon was the weakest man in Israel. And that's who God wanted to choose to liberate them. Gideon, like all other people that God uses in Scripture, all other broken people, asks God for signs. He says, look, if I'm about to die, at least I want to know it was actually God. And God gives him multiple signs. I love that. We have a God that even in our brokenness, he will give us every opportunity to choose him. So verse 22, when when Gideon experienced this God, it says this, that Gideon perceived, the presence to be perceived, Gideon perceived that this was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, help me. Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is shalom. As I've said multiple times, the only source of peace, the only source of shalom is God. What's shalom? Shalom is a long life activity that is enjoyed exclusively in the presence of God. And shalom is the inheritance of anyone who knows God. And God's conversation teaches us that we can have shalom during depression. We can have shalom during disaster. We can have shalom during the deepest, worst times of our lives. Why? Because if God is the creator of the universe... And if this creator of the universe is always with us, then God's shalom is always within our reach. Gideon's story doesn't end there. He still has to defeat the Midianites. So to make sure that Gideon and God's people remember this for the rest of their lives, to make sure that they remember the time when God came to humanity as shalom, God sends Gideon, a farmer, into battle. And he sends them, not with 22,000 men. Originally, 
Gideon had 22,000 men. And they were already, already at a disadvantage. Because remember, they're still being oppressed with 22,000 men. But just to understand how much of a statistical disadvantage they were, God says, no, take 300 men. <laughs> Gideon is like, okay. And with God's help, they overcame their oppressors, the Midianites. Because God was with them. God was their peace. As Christians, we don't, walk, we don't work from a loss. We always work from a win. Because God has already won. And here's what you need to know. Here's what Gideon's story teaches me, and I hope that you get this. God, the giver of peace, does not need a statistical advantage to win. He's already won. He always gets a W. We don't go into peace feeling, oh, I hope God wins. We work out of a win. That's why we overcome, because God already overcame. Some of you might identify with Gideon. Maybe you're facing stress from an internal kind of thing. You would feel less. Or maybe an outward situation, an outward person is oppressing you. God's shalom is within your reach today. Some of you may have done some awful things, and those evil things have contributed to your stress. They've perpetuated more anxiousness and, and fear, leaving you feeling useless like Gideon was. What's the good news for you today? God has always given you the option to choose his shalom. Your past does not discredit you from shalom, from him. And even non-Christians are picking up on this idea of finding shalom in God's presence. The American Heart Association have a study that says that spending time in nature can help relieve stress, improve your mood, and well-being. These are non-Christians. And one researcher even writes this. He says this. Human beings still have a deep connection with nature. And research shows that if we don't nourish this bond... Despite our technological advancements, we may suffer in many ways. I believe what they're calling this deep connection in nature, this bond is actually God's shalom. The way the world should be. Atheists or not, humans cannot deny that there's a sense of something bigger when they're in nature. When they're in the forest, when they're with animals sometimes. I think it's because our beautiful, big, vast world screams of a creator. And isn't it crazy? Even after we we dismiss God sometimes, that creator is screaming at us saying, I want you closer. And even non-Christians, they can experience a little bit of the shalom. That's the God we serve. So science affirms scripture. And both are telling us that humans feel a sense of release and a sense of purpose. Even if it's just for a tiny second. When they are in God's creation. And when they're in God's creation, they experience God's presence. When humans, when we are in a shalom, we can find physical, we can find mental, we can find emotional liberation. Do you believe that? And it's not just enough to know to study this historical account of God revealing himself to humanity as our shalom. We must understand how to foster shalom in our lives and in the lives of others. Church, if we don't understand how to foster shalom, we will burn out in this stress-filled world that wants to choke us of our time and our energy to serve God and serve others. We... As a church, we as a community, we must work against this disgusting idea that we can buy peace. Even when we don't have to. Peace is free because we find our peace in our God, the creator of the earth, who fills us with his presence, who fills us with his purpose, who fills us with his peace. If you want to experience more of God's unlimited and free shalom in your life, you're in the best service possible. (laughs) And here's the cool thing. I love this. When God's shalom is so prevalent in your life, when you're flourishing with the presence of God, guess what? Other people get to experience God's peace. 
Other people get to experience God's presence. Other people get to experience God's shalom. Other people experience the world as it should be. So it's not just for us. That means that God's shalom can actually work through counseling, through these communities that we find ourselves in. Because God has put people in our lives to foster shalom. Are we paying attention? And are we fostering shalom? Yeah, some of us might have conflict, and that's okay. Peace is not found in the absence of conflict. It's found in the presence of wholesome relationship across human division. We can actually find peace in conflict because our God is with us. In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a mental health distress, in the midst of a statistically unwinnable situation, enter whatever you want. We can find peace because God wants to fill us with his shalom. And here's two practical things I just felt like I wanted to leave with you as a result of this message. Super practical. First thing, how have I been able to experience more shalom? I had to stop waking up to my phone. That's the first practical thing. Stop waking up to your phones. I literally cannot think of a worse way to begin the day than to, that God created than to start by being sucked into our phones, into our TV, into the emails, or to, to, to the to-do list, into the stress-filled things that this world wants to fill us with. Waking up to our phones makes us oblivious to the God that is around us and with us, a God who desires relationship even more than we do. And why? Why is this so important? Why is this so important? Because what we give our attention to is the person that we become. So as you deal with stress, one of the biggest questions is, where is God? Is God so far away? I can't hear him. I can't feel him. But the question should be, what are we allowing to steal our attention? That usually is our phone when we start our day with it. Because remember, God, Jesus, doesn't give peace like the world does. Because his shalom is available to us anytime, any day, anywhere. God's very own spirit is in us and around us at all times. So what do we do if we stop waking up to our phones? But we need to start waking up to the word of God early in the morning. Guys, people are so addicted to feeling spiritual. Christians, or even non-Christians, will spend thousands of dollars on conferences just to feel something. And me? Someone gave me the cheapest alternative when I was in youth. A guy named Harmon said this. Hey, you know there's a, there's a collection of historical narratives. There's a collection of beautiful poems, of tweetable advices, of prison letters. There's literally a collection of the biography of God literally roaming the earth. All in one collection, brilliantly designed and written by different authors, telling all one story. A true story about a God who desires to be in relationship with us so much that he would stop at nothing to restore you. And even if the statistics aren't in his favor, in this book, sometimes the statistics are not in God's favor. But God set a new statistic when he sent his son, Jesus. And through Jesus, God wants to give you shalom, not just today, not just tomorrow, every single day of your life. Harmon told me that people would die to make this collection a reality, to preserve it so I could read it. And he said this, if you fill your life with the contents of this book, you'll be filled with the very presence of God. And you'll be able to take that presence wherever you go. Best deal of my life. I got this Bible for free. I have to pay for thousands of dollars for conferences. Spent it on shoes instead. Just kidding. <laughs> Just these two things. Stopping to read the word rather than wake up to your phone. That can make a world of a difference. Why so simple? It's because the peace that you and I were created for, it's not found in less conflict. It's not found in the accumulation of more stuff. It's found in the presence of God. 
And this peace that we call shalom, we can fill our lives with shalom when we fill our lives with God's word. Shalom for me is Saturday morning, I got tea, open up the Bible, no Arsenal games, not anymore, stop watching them. And even though there's conflict, even though there's stuff in my life, I relinquish control. I work to have wholesome relationships, even across human division. I focus on the one relationship that matters. To drive this point home, I wanted to invite one of my friends and most trusted youth leaders, most trusted friends, to share a story of how she experienced God's shalom in one of the most stressful periods of her life. Church, would you join me in welcoming Michaela to the stage? Hello. Oh, there we go. Hi, everyone. Um, as the full face said, my name is Michaela. I will say my new last name once because it is quite a mouthful, and you can ask me about it later if you have questions. Uh, so my full name is Michaela Lichashorstova. Um, yeah, it's quite a mouthful, hey? I have been a youth leader here uh, at BP Church for the last, oh, it'll be my eighth year this fall. I have also been part of our young adults leadership team here at the church, and you may have recognized me from playing keys on weekend worship sometimes. Uh, but outside of church, I am a registered nurse. I work at a post-surgical unit at Rocky View, and I also recently just celebrated one year of marriage to my husband, Bogdan, which is amazing because love is great, and weddings are awesome. <sighs> when Afobe asked me to share about peace, I kind of laughed at him at first, I'm not going to lie, because I am no stranger to stress. I, uh, my personality, I love to overthink things, and I love to have a, a little bit of control over things of my life. And I spent four years in nursing school, so that should tell you what I know about stress. Uh, but God has really done a big work in me over this last year to help me really understand what it means to have peace in stressful situations. So, I'm going to invite you guys to take a journey with me back to March of 2020. Now, I don't have to go into much detail to explain what we all felt last March of 2020 when the world suddenly flipped upside down. We were in the midst of a global pandemic. Everything that we knew that was normal became abnormal. Everything that was predictable in our life suddenly became unpredictable. And there was a lot of fear and anxiety surrounding every aspect of our lives. This period of my life, I work in healthcare. And I was also eight months deep in planning my wedding. Man, what a time. A little bit about me when I was younger. You could find me Saturday mornings watching reruns of Say Yes to the Dress and Four Weddings because I love love. And so when I finally got my opportunity to have my wedding and plan it, I seized it. And in March, I felt myself suddenly having that ripped from underneath me. And I remember being incredibly hurt and incredibly frustrated and asking God, why are you doing this? What is going on, God? Like, why, why, why would you have me plan my wedding in this time? You know how much I love this. You know how much I've been looking forward to this day. Why would you do this? And a little bit of backstory about me and my husband. Um, our lives are a lot, uh, are so much different, or so much more than just a unity between me and him. Uh, his parents actually moved his family from the Ukraine about 10 years ago when they fled the Civil War uh, to give their kids an opportunity at a new life. And so our marriage wasn't just a, a bond between me and him. It was actually a, a uniting of two very vastly different cultures in two vastly different countries. And so I was very excited to be welcoming his family uh, to Canada to celebrate our wedding. My family is predominantly from southern Ontario, so a lot of them couldn't come. And my closest brother, um, well, the other two are not going to like that statement, but that's okay, um, lives in Australia, and he actually couldn't be able, he wasn't able to be there for that day either. And so I was just caught in this whirlwind of like, God, I thought that this, this is what you wanted. 
Like, I believe, and in our word, and in, in, in a Christian, in our Bibles, marriage is this covenant, this very sacred covenant that you make between, you know, you, your spouse, and God. And so I remember sitting there in March and in the early stages of April being like, God, I know that this is yours. I know that this is yours, so why is this happening? And I kind of just laid it all on the line for him, and I said, okay, God, like, I believe that this is yours. I believe that my marriage belongs to you. I believe that this covenant is so sacred that you have big plans for it. And so I'm going to relinquish all of my control over this day and how this will look to you. And I will trust that whatever happens going forward, it's going to be for your glory. And that was a big step for me because I really like having control on things. But God really worked through me during those months. And church, I really wish I could tell you that the situation around me got better after I made that decision, but I can assure you it got worse, a heck of a lot worse. Because during those months, not only did I have to replan my entire wedding, but a lot of fighting broke out between my family because everyone was coping with COVID differently. I had lots of arguments with friends and a lot of people weren't able to come. Businesses that we were in partnership with ended up going out of business. It literally felt like every single thing going forward just didn't work in my favor. And I had this incredible confidence through it all that it didn't matter because that day was God's and he was going to get me through. And I think that sometimes when we step into the presence of God and we step into what he's asked for us, Satan loves to come and weasel his way in there and try to make you doubt that you made the right decision to follow God. And so he starts to twist things, he starts to turn things, and he starts to get his feet into situations because he wants to, with all of his might, to turn you away from walking into the, into the steps of God and what he has for you. And that happened right up until the very last week of my wedding when the weather uh, suddenly went from a 25 beautiful sunny weekend to pouring rain and thunderstorms. And my wedding was outdoors in BC. And I remember my parents actually crying the week before my wedding to me saying, oh, Michaela, you gave up so much. You know, we just just wished for a, a sunny day. Like, that's the least we could do. But let me tell you, I have never been more thankful for rain. Because on the day of my wedding came, sure enough, it was pouring rain. And when I mean pouring, I mean like monsoon, wind blowing sideways. You couldn't see the across the lake. Fog had come in, thunderstorming wedding day. It was cold. It was ugly. And I remember I was getting ready and some of my friends would like try to shield me from the windows outside to like somehow save me or protect me from what was going on. And I remember sitting there like laughing and being so happy because I was walking in the peace that God had given me because I knew that that day was his. And so I actually remember at one point I started laughing and I said, Satan, is this, is this the best that you can do? Like, is this all you have for me? Like, what else you got? Because nothing you can do this day is going to take away from what's about to happen. Regardless of if it's raining outside, a covenant with God is going to be made this day. And you can't stop that. And so I was just in this this beautiful state where I was able to see and feel the joy of the Lord because I was in his peace. And I had a miracle happen that day, guys. Because when I walked down that aisle, I had sunshine. (laughs) And then, as soon as that ceremony was over, poured rain. Poured rain. And then when we were taking pictures, we got sun. And as soon as we were done, poured rain. (laughs) And every single moment that day that I needed God to come and, and clear the rain, he did. And so I got to see a miracle of God saying, I have this day. This is my day. And the crazy thing about being in that joy and being able to um, remove yourself from the situation and relinquish full control to God is you're able to experience what it means to have the joy of the Lord. And it's actually, just as Afope said, so infectious to those around you. To this day, I actually have my dad last week, surprisingly enough, came up to me and he said, I still can't believe how you were on your wedding day. I can't believe it. Because some t- when the, the situation was crazy and chaotic, and I was happy. 
And so sometimes when you're in that joy of the Lord, it's going to be unexplainable to other people, but it's a testimony of who God is. And so I encourage you guys today that if there's an area of your life that you're, you're feeling stressed, I implore you to take an objective look at that situation and see where there's areas there that you are holding on to that control. And I encourage you to ask God to let you surrender that to him. Because I truly believe that when you surrender and you have full trust um, in God that he has your situation, that's when you experience that confidence and that peace that he has. And if you're struggling with that, then I encourage you to do exactly what Afope said today. Get immersed in your word. Because when you know the God that you serve, when you understand his promises, when you understand his character, and you understand that he has never lost, and he never will, and he's not going to start with you. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And if we believe that, then the promises he made in this book are going to be true to this day. And so when you can understand and truly begin to trust that person, that control that you have is going to be easier to let go. So yeah, that is my story about how God has, uh, has shown me peace. And it's actually been uh, a catalyst into being um, an example of when I needed peace in other areas of my life, especially looking for a nursing job in a pandemic. And in uh, writing my nursing board exam last year, God just showed up and gave me peace that truly um, transcended all understanding. So yeah, thanks church for letting me share. Mom, Hope you guys have a great Sunday. Amazing. great story. God's peace is available for you this weekend. God's shalom is within your reach. We're going to go into a song um, in, a, in a few moments, but I just want to give you a chance to respond. And if you're like, I did not know that God was this way. I did not know that Jesus was this way. And I know that God saw me in my chaos. God sees me in my troubles. And yet, he sent his peace to dwell among us. God sent his peace so you and I can be restored into a relationship with God. We can live in the world the way it should be. And we can live in relationship with God.